Cities need to make choices about infrastructure, how energy, transport, water, sewage, waste will be handled. Cities are complex organisms, often with millions of people interacting uh, with industrial processes uh, and uh, complex uh, transportation and communications needs as well. How to make the best of this uh, tight, uh, densely uh, settled uh, region, how to get the most productivity and the highest quality of life uh, is a matter of choice. And cities that plan well, design infrastructure well, are able to maximize economic opportunities, improve quality of life, promote public health, and minimize the impact of the population on the natural environment, including a relatively low carbon economy. Some aspects of that core infrastructure include transportation. In densely settled areas, relying on the automobile is a recipe for massive congestion, air pollution, and greenhouse gas emissions. And there are much better options of public transport and when properly designed of walking and, and bicycling for a large number of one's needs in urban areas. Uh, water management, uh, a huge challenge. Uh, water has to be provided safely. Sewerage has to be handled safely every day, day in and day out. And uh, with rising populations, cities of course have to anticipate their growing water needs. This requires foresight and I'll explain how New York City has faced uh, this challenge. Cities generate massive amounts of waste, organic waste from food that is uh, disposed of, sewerage, uh, industrial waste, packaging materials, newspaper and other paper uh, to be recycled, and how those millions and millions of tons of waste uh, handled uh, each year are disposed of or recycled is a major factor in the city's impact on the environment and on its own uh, quality of life uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, the greening of its own environment. How the building codes determine the kinds of buildings that are built, where they're built, what their zoning is, is another aspect of the choices and I will give some indication about that as well. Well, some cities have managed their transport well, and in other places, it's chaotic beyond imagining. Uh, look at the commuters uh, in Indonesia, uh, packed uh, to uh, a life-threatening extent. Compare that with the, one of the world's uh, most sparkling, efficient, uh, dynamic uh, metro systems uh, in Seoul, South Korea, uh, which is a, a huge system of hundreds of kilometers of line, uh, Beijing and countless Chinese cities, <coughs> uh, the large ones, have all been building metro systems uh, in recent years as well, serving them very well and wisely making the investments in mass public transportation because the alternative for China will be and is threatened to be a massive explosion of automobile use with all of the ecological and economic ills that could attend to that. Bogota became famous as the exemplar of another kind of uh, public transportation, that's bus rapid transit. It followed another city, Curitiba, Brazil, which pioneered bus rapid transit in the 1970s. The idea was to encourage people to move away from automobiles to buses by giving buses favorable conditions of access on dedicated lanes, very frequent service, and comfortable ways for people to get in and out of buses waiting in stations and with stations located in convenient areas. Here you see in Bogota uh, the famous uh, red bus of their bus rapid transit system 
uh, entering uh, one of uh, the covered stations, a, a comfortable and safe area for people to get on and off of the buses. And Bogota gets rave reviews from its own citizens uh, and uh, from around the world. Uh, it gets uh, uh, people trying to learn the lessons of Bogota's rapid transit system and it therefore has won many, many emulators around the world. Recently, cities have started to uh, make a full arc to uh, their earlier traditions. Uh, and that is uh, also to uh, make sure that there are safe, open areas for bicycling. Uh, Europe has taken the lead in this uh, with, the bus, uh, with the bicycle lanes uh, in uh, many of uh, Europe's wonderful cities. And with innovative ways now, with smart cards and uh, with the shared uh, bicycle systems such as uh, this one in Paris, uh, that are leading to uh, a renewal of what was once discarded in favor of the car, but because of congestion, because of the expenses of managing automobiles, because of the difficulties of parking, of traffic jams, because of individuals' concerns, uh, with their own uh, CO2 emissions and contributions to climate change, people, and I should add, with the people seeking a healthier uh, way to uh, get to work and to spend their days, there's been a uh, return to bike lanes and bicycle use. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to say in New York City, uh, this is uh, also taking hold with great popularity. And it, it is an important step forward, not only for all of the ecological reasons, but for the public health reasons as well. Urbanites have come to understand in the last 20 years the hard way that if they take sedentarism to the extreme, they're not out working the fields, they're in office jobs, uh, in uh, the service economy, the risks to their own health showing up in obesity, in heart disease, uh, in other costs of sedentarism are very, very high. So people are eager to find ways to get back out onto the streets, pedestrian areas in city centers, encouraging people to walk. Uh, often uh, the streets are being closed to cars. Uh, the congestion has just gotten out of hand. Quality of life has diminished and people by the thousands and by the millions uh, added up over a year are encouraged to get out and walk as they are in the Ramblas uh, in uh, the center of Barcelona. And this too is becoming a strategy of choice of uh, urban zoning, especially for the core urban areas. And it is being supported not only by access to pedestrian walkways, to bicycle lanes, to improved mass transit, but also through policies such as congestion taxation, in which people are charged a steep price for entering the center of cities in their automobiles, giving a strong economic push to get out of the car, leave the car behind. For moving between cities, there are also big choices. In the United States in the 1950s, a breakthrough was made to connect America's cities by the interstate highway system. It had a very large economic impact, of course. It was an efficiency enhancer from the point of view of moving goods and moving people. It also facilitated the spread of suburbanization in the United States because highways linked suburbs with center cities, uh, having people move farther out from the densely populated center cities, and also thereby contributing to America's remarkably high ecological footprint, its extraordinarily high level of CO2 emissions per capita. China, fortunately, has gone in a different direction. Rather than uh, encouraging people to move between China's cities, and China has the world's largest network of large cities of more than a million people. It has built and continues to build tens of thousands of kilometers of fast rail to connect China's cities. 
this uh, electrified transport if the electricity grid turns green, a very important step that China will need to take in future years, will enable a, a low emission transport system and also one that will allow people to move uh, very quickly uh, with much less congestion and with uh, much less investment in uh, automobiles than was true in the United States. In the U.S., there are roughly 250 million personal vehicles for a 310 million population, roughly five uh, personal vehicles for every six people in, in the population. In China, the equivalent would be more than one billion cars. China currently has on the order of probably 120 million vehicles or so. The number is rising now quite quickly because China has become the world's largest automobile market. But if China were to go all the way to the U.S. automobile density, not only would it become the world's largest traffic jam, but China's energy needs and its carbon emissions would be completely out of sight. So China needs to continue to take smart choices like an electrified intercity fast rail system. Let me turn to another aspect of infrastructure, water supply. Every big city has to provision for drinking water for its population as well as water for other uses for that part of urban agriculture and for industrial uses of water. And how to do that effectively is a major challenge. In New York City, this has been addressed for more than a century by tapping into water reservoirs outside of the city and carried to the city uh, by huge pipes that bring water from two big watersheds. Uh, one you see on the map called the Catskills in the in a, in a uh, um, hill and mountain area near the Hudson River, and another in what's called the, the Croton watershed, uh, both of which are connected by huge uh, underground uh, pipes to provision New York. The reason that this is quite interesting is that about 15 years ago, New York faced the problem that the water coming from both of these areas was becoming more turbid, uh, more polluted, more uh, containing chemical uh, products and, and the uh, outflow of industrial and farm activities in the areas nearby these two watersheds. And the proposal at the time was to build a multi-billion dollar water treatment sites to uh, keep New York City water safe. And that would be the intuitive step. The water is getting dirtier, you have to treat the water. And giant waste treatment sites for a city of uh, 8 million plus people seem to be inevitable. But the, the city planners at the time had a clever realization. And that is that it would be safer and smarter to encourage these out of state or out of uh, city areas, I should say, near the watersheds to engage in fewer activities that endangered the water supply to keep the water clean and safe so that these multi-billion dollar investments of water treatment would not have to be made. Of course, those areas had their own economic interests. And so New York City realized that it would have to provide a financial incentive to both the Catskills and the Croton watershed areas to desist from the kinds of farm activities, <clears throat> use of fertilizers, pesticides, and so forth that would endanger New York City's drinking water. And sure enough, the city arranged for a financial transfer to these outlying areas to compensate for cutting back on some of the more dangerous processes. It's a rather ingenious idea, not easily organized by a market, but by a political agreement that 
satisfied the interests of both the New York City residents who thereby avoided billions and billions of dollars of water treatment and the residents of these outlying areas who did desist from certain profitable economic activities but where their cities received compensating benefits. Now it's still true 15 years later that there's going to have to be a bit more waste and water treatment uh, to keep uh, the water standards uh, at uh, the high quality levels. But still, this idea, even taking into account uh, the further needs for uh, water treatment, has made it possible for New York City to find a lower cost, safer, and ultimately high quality way to preserve its water supply. That's very specific uh, for New York. Every city, every major urban agglomeration has to solve a problem like this. I think that not only is New York's solution a very interesting one, because it's a very unusual one and it had to be put together with a lot of creativity, insight, and good political management, but it also highlights something that's very important in my view, and that is sustainable development is inherently an exercise in problem solving. Thinking out of the box, thinking out of the watershed, thinking out of the city, finding better ways to do things that can't be found necessarily in the textbooks alone. It's being creative and creating new models. Yet another aspect of urban infrastructure, absolutely essential, and that is what to do with all of that waste. Some of it, paper and plastics, may be recyclable. Uh, other uh, parts of the waste, uh, maybe some of the scrap metal, can also be reprocessed. A lot of the waste is organic waste, food uh, into uh, the garbage bags, for example, uh, rotted uh, food or uh, food that's uh, thrown out from uh, restaurants and, and, uh, uh, and homes. How to handle all of this waste? Again, the usual way in the past was truly to regard it as waste and stick it someplace, especially in landfills. And many large cities around the world built massive, massive human waste dumps uh, that were fetid eyesores, nose sores, actually carriers of pollution, and sites of massive greenhouse gas emissions because these uh, landfills emit methane, uh, among other gases, and methane is one of the most potent of the greenhouse gases. Engineers came to understand much better that simply filling the land with this kind of waste was terribly unwise, dangerous for the land, dangerous for the water supply, dangerous for the air around it, dangerous for the residents living nearby, dangerous for greenhouse gas emissions, and a huge waste because a lot of what was going into the landfills could be inputs for recycling, for industrial processes, even for the generation of energy. So in the last 20 years, cities have experimented with many different kinds of recycling programs and with various kinds of innovative waste to energy facilities. In Western Europe, uh, Denmark, among other places, has been a leader also in waste to energy, in using various kinds of waste gas uh, for power generation and uh, not only for power, but for this idea that the electricity goes out into the grid and the heat exhaust from combustion, rather than simply going into the atmosphere, is itself collected and, in the case of Denmark, pumped to uh, urban settlement areas to heat water for homes, uh, as well as to heat the homes themselves during the wintertime. In general, we're going to see a lot of smartening up 
of structures, buildings, recycling, and of the power grid itself. The concept that many cities around the world are now adopting in a general term that will be gaining more and more specificity and examples in the coming years is an urban smart grid. That urban smart grid may mean a smart interconnection of mobility, of public transportation, individual <coughs> electric vehicles, the power grid, the household electricity use, the interconnections with the waste processing of the cities through cogeneration or use of waste gas for electricity generation. One of the characteristics of the smart grid is the use of information technologies as a breakthrough in a way to be far more efficient also in the energy use. Sensors, microsensors uh, in housing, in appliances, in automobiles will allow an interconnected power grid directly communicating with households and with businesses to economize on energy use, to send signals of when an extra uh, power load is going to be needed, and to allow off-grid, decentralized uh, power sources to smartly connect with the grid, whether it's solar panels uh, or uh, other kinds of distributed uh, power generation that right now stands alone, but that will be connected in a smart way through a metered system to an integrated smart grid for the city. Finally, let me mention that as part of uh, this smart infrastructure is smarter and smarter building codes. Buildings can be built to be efficient uh, if they are properly engineered for proper insulation, proper location with regard to sunshine, with natural ventilation rather than, uh, rather than ventilation driven by heating and air conditioning, with recycling of water within the facilities themselves, even with cogeneration facilities dedicated to a smart building like uh, the uh, Bank of America Tower in my own city of New York, uh, a skyscraper that meets the uh, ultimate platinum LEED standard, uh, which is the standard for uh, evaluating the ecological impact of buildings. One of the smart things that this very smart Bank of America Tower does is that it has a cogeneration facility for its own power needs and using the heat from that for the hot water and for the ventilation in the building itself. All of this shows technological innovation at play, information systems, smarter transport, smarter ways to recycle materials to close the loop so that cities can achieve what is within their potential. Very high quality of life, an interconnected grid for transport, for power, for water, for sewerage, and in a way with a very low and falling ecological footprint.